It is uh, really a pleasure to introduce the speaker for the, uh, going to give us our closing remarks today. And uh, you all know this is uh, Susan Lindquist, who's from the Whitehead. Now, Susan has, has shown how the forces of protein folding have profound and unexpected impact on evolution and human disease. Probably, for me, one of the more remarkable aspects of her uh, career is the, in, in recent times how she has been able to take a multi-species approach and take and make fundamental discoveries and then rapidly translate them into things that have very applied applications. And this move of hers in this direction has really been resonating in many uh, fields, and especially in the neurological fields that I've been following. And it's a real pleasure every time to listen to her and hear the new stories that she brings. So I'd like you all to welcome Susan. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, when I was uh, asked to give this talk, I hadn't yet published my first stem cell paper. And of course, the idea was to bring to you some some uh, broader uh, aspects of biology <laughs> that you might not normally hear. Since then, we've actually published our first stem cell paper, and we're actually very excited about stem cell research. So I'm going to kind of do a crossover talk and tell you about some of our basic uh, research findings over the years that have led to really um, going from very basic science into wanting to try to do something translational in terms of lots of different protein folding diseases and uh, finally finish up with our first foray into stem cells. So here you see two proteins. And the difficulty that proteins face in getting folded in biological systems is that it is insanely crowded inside the environment of the cell. So you imagine these proteins coming out as long amino acid sequences out of the ribosome, and they have to get into those very, very specific shapes. And they have to do this in, in this insanely crowded environment where things are moving around really fast. And so uh, this extraordinary kinetic energy of all biological systems actually creates really remarkable problems uh, in many, many different areas of biology. It also, of course, is what this energy and, and crowdedness is what makes an awful lot of uh, the most key and fundamental aspects of, of biological systems possible. Life wouldn't exist without this. So virtually every organism is kind of poised on a, a knife edge of, of proteins um, misfolding and, and going off pathway. And, especially want to mention to you in terms of that uh, simulation by Adrian Elcock that the, uh, that's, that's a really a very slowed down, steady version of reality. It's not that you would need to normally speed that up 100 times or 1,000 times or 100,000 times, but 1 million times to get an actual feeling for how much proteins are crashing around into each other all the time. It's an extraordinary dynamic system that we really normally, when we look at static pictures in textbooks, don't realize. So, sorry, I converted all my slides to, to PowerPoint specifically because I heard that there were problems, and hopefully that, that'll be the last one. <laughs> anyway, uh, I first got interested in this when I was studying something called the heat shock response, and uh, I, we've done this in several different organisms. And what this simple experiment is, is, is two aliquots of a yeast culture were both exposed to high temperatures and then plated out. The same exact heat treatment, but this uh, aliquot first got a mild pretreatment, half an hour, 39 degrees. And then um, this is a similar experiment that Christine Quench did in my laboratory with the Rabidopsis seedlings, same idea. Uh, two uh, plated out groups of cells grown at the same temperature, gro groups of plants grown at the same temperature, and then shifted up to the same high temperature. The only difference being that this one here first got a mild pretreatment for a couple of hours. And then this is the same thing done with human cells. And basically, the take-home message is that 
Every organism on the planet does this. Mild conditioning preheat treatments and just an extraordinary ability to survive subsequent much more severe stresses. So what are the cells and organisms doing during those periods when they're, they're acquiring these remarkable capacities to survive? And the answer is that they're making something called heat shock proteins. Now there's all kinds of complexity to these responses, many metabolic changes and signal transduction changes. But there's, uh, if you look at this uh, simple gel labeling of cells um, grown at the normal temperature or at this conditioning pretreatment, you can see that there's a massive, massive synthesis of new proteins, and those are called the heat shock proteins. And it turns out that they provide protection against all sorts of different stresses. They provide protection against heat, but against changes in pH, against changes in oxidation levels, against changes in heavy metal ions. Just remarkably protective because all of those stresses cause that extreme, extraordinary cellular protein folding and, and crowding situation to get worse, and it gets worse in a hurry. So this is a very broadly used response, all sorts of stresses, every organism on the planet. And of course, it won't surprise you then to think about the fact that that plays out in all kinds of aspects of human biology and medicine. And so, for example, when a, a fungal pathogen invades our body, as, uh, and the, uh, this is viewed here in, uh, in green, the different m morphological forms that this fungus has when it's grown at normal temperatures versus when it's injected into us, um, it undergoes a profound change in its biology, and that is in part fueled by this heat shock response. And then, in fact, our bodies raise the temperature on these organisms in order in an attempt to make things even worse for them. And uh, that's, that's really profoundly important in uh, pathogenic biology. And we're trying to find ways to stop that. We are also working on cancer biology because it turns out, and I'll show you a few slides on this, it turns out that this heat shock response is profoundly taken advantage of by cancer cells as they invade us and as they learn to grow, proliferate, and invade new, new niches in our own body and metastasize. And then finally, I'm going to tell you something a little bit, little bit more detail about some of the work we're doing to combat the problems in protein folding that arise in neurodegenerative diseases. So it turns out that all of those proteins, these that are made in massive quantities, are proteins that are involved in taking care of protein folding problems. So they're protein chaperones, for example, proteins that bind immature proteins that haven't finished folding, prevent them from making inappropriate liaisons with other proteins. Um, there are also protein remodeling factors. There are proteases that help to get rid of uh, proteins that have misfolded. They, they do all sorts of things, but they primarily take care of protein folding problems. So it turns out that if you take a sum of, of how this very ancient survival response is playing out, in these different aspects of human medicine and biology, uh, we are rather between a rock and a hard place. And the reason for that is that both cancer cells and infectious organisms are using their survival response in order to kill us, basically. And our brains, which are experiencing these terrible protein misfolding problems in neurodegenerative diseases, are not using their own survival response to protect us. So we're hoping that potentially there is some real uh, possibility of blocking the heat shock survival response, as I mentioned, to, um, to interfere with pathogens as they invade us, and also to actually promote a survival in cancer. And the reason for this is that we think short-term inhibition of the heat shock response and of specific heat shock proteins um, might be efficacious in cancer because it would be relatively short term. So what's the evidence that blocking the heat shock response might actually, if we could do that, might actually have some effect on the biology of, of the organism? Well, we first started out with mice. And so we painted the backs of mice uh, with a mutagen that is, is very, very commonly used, very old uh, cancer ca chemical carcinogenesis model. And the mouse, mice sprouted tumors. And um, if we used 
the exact, did this exact same uh, protocol with mice that had a knockout mutation in the master regulator of their heat shock response, HSF, heat shock factor, that's the transcriptional regulator of the heat shock response that turns on that whole gamut of, uh, of proteins. The mice are perfectly fine when they have that knockout, and in fact they live long lives, but um, they are affected in a variety of different ways, one of which is that they're profoundly protected from cancer. Now, we started with this chemical carcinogenesis model because it was easy to do, but we then subsequently went on to mouse models of p53 mutations. So this chemical carcinogenesis model is driven by oncogenic mutations in the RAS oncogene. We also wondered, well, what about um, to cancers that are driven by tumor suppressors. And so we got similarly dramatic differences in the mice uh, with P53. And I should say that these differences in tumor burdens translate very directly into huge differences in survival. And that work has been published in a while. I don't have time to go through it. We also did it with an NF1 knockout, the, um, the most common predisposition, cancer predisposition, genetic form. Uh, in human beings, and other folks have now uh, found very strong evidence that this plays a big role in uh, determining the outcomes in mice for melanomas and uh, hepatocarcinomas. But what about people? Because cancer in mice really is not equivalent to cancer in people. So to look at that, what we did was we took an antibody against HSF, this heat shock transcription factor, and we looked in human tumors directly resected from patients. And so um, here you see a really nice uh, kind of slide, and I'll show you some more of these, where we've actually uh, caught the border between the tumor and the normal uh, tissue. And that's very helpful because when, you take, when tissues are taken out of a patient in an operating room, they're thrown into fixative, they're all over the world, they're being done in slightly different ways, and you worry about fixation conditions and accessibility of the antibody, for example. But, so having caught this special slide here, you can see that HSF in brown is out in the cytoplasm in the normal tissue. But as soon as you cross over into the tumor, you see massive upregulation of HSF and massive um, uh, concentration of this transcription factor now moving from the cytoplasm into the nucleus driving that heat shock response. And this is pancreatic cancer. And this is colon cancer. And this is lung cancer. We've stained thousands and thousands of sections of many, many, many different types of cancers. And it's extraordinary how many of them you see evidence of this heat shock response driving the survival pathways and, and more in these cells. Now, the interesting thing, however, and a very valuable thing in terms of understanding the biology of this heat shock response in these tumors was that it's not on in all of them. So it's on in most uh, breast cancers, but not in all. It's on in most, majority of colon cancers, but not in all, et cetera. So that allowed us to actually score very early biopsies that have been taken many, many years ago, score them blindly by two different pathologists, and ask whether the outcomes in the long run, 20 years later, mattered whether those people happened to have, in their tumors, they happened to have a heat shock response on or not. The first one we did was uh, using the nurses' health study. We studied, uh, stained thousands of sections from these nurses. And in fact, um, scoring for whether or not they had a high intermediate or low level of HSF in their initial tumors, and then looking at their survival years post biopsy, whether or not they had a heat shock response on when that tumor first started was a very, very strong determinant of outcome or very strong correlate with outcome. So it does matter. The same thing happens in colon and lung cancer. And in terms of what we can do, well, what we think we might be able to do is use this diagnostically to identify in early tumors the ones that are the most dangerous. Um, if we can figure out how to block it, and we're trying to do that now, we might be able to combine these two approaches therapeutically.
We're a long way from doing it, but that's one of the ways in which we're trying to move now between basic biology into uh, human biology and disease. So what about neurodegeneration? Well, some people are trying to actually find chemical compounds that will turn on a heat shock response. And we have some of those, and we think they might turn out to be interesting in neurodegeneration to sort of restart that protein homeostasis response in the brain. But actually, I'm quite concerned that that might be dangerous, given the role I've just shown you that this response seems to play in cancer biology. I would think that treating people for years and years and years, people who are suffering from neurodegeneration, need to be treated for that long. It might not be a good idea to turn up their heat shock response. It might make them more susceptible to things like cancer. So instead, what we've been doing is taking an approach where we look very specifically at things that are going wrong when individual proteins misfold in the brain and seeing if we can find ways to combat them. Now, the uh, landscape of protein misfolding in the human brain is, is really a complex and interesting one. In some cases, the very same protein, for example, here, front, uh, TDP43 is a protein that's found in these misfolded brown globs in, in the brain, in different regions of the brain, in people suffering from different diseases, frontal temporal dementia in one case, and ALS in another case. And then different proteins are misfolding in different places and causing different diseases, at least very strongly associated with them. So here's alpha-synuclein misfolding in some cell types that give a dementia, where it's associated with dementia with Lewy bodies, and in other cell types where it's associated with Parkinson's disease. It's also associated with MSA and other uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And in Alzheimer's disease, of course, there's a beta and tau tangles and Huntington's disease, et cetera. The, these big major killers that strike us uh, as we are getting older and being able to live longer and longer lives, neurodegeneration is striking more and more of us through these protein folding diseases. So we got the idea, given what I started this um, presentation by saying is that this is such a highly, highly conserved uh, process that protein folding landscape of all cells is, is really very similar. We thought, well, maybe we could actually take advantage of this conservation and use yeast to study some of these protein misfolding diseases. And the basic response was, um, are you crazy? And the reason I didn't think it was crazy was because yeast are really extremely highly sophisticated eukaryotic cells. They have unparalleled genetics. There's just no organism on this earth that we can manipulate like we can yeast cells. And they're remarkably bust for, robust for high throughput screening of genetics and chemical compounds. And um, they have all the same basic processes and pathways that we know are profoundly affected and feature in the pathology of neurodegenerative diseases. So all of that protein folding stuff I told you about, the chaperones and protein degradation machinery and what we call quality control machinery of protein homeostasis is the same. But in addition, yeast cells have very highly conserved lipid biology, vesicular trafficking, the proteins that are involved in trafficking vesicles around in our brain, were actually initially first found in yeast. Lysosomes and peroxisome function, autophagy, apoptosis, complex cell cycle, mitochondria, oxidative stress, and the weird thing is that they are also single cells. And in some ways, we thought that actually might be really advantageous because uh, when you study neurons in culture, uh, they are talking to each other profoundly and also communicating with glia profoundly. And these interactions are very, very complex and it's difficult to unravel. So we thought, well, if we're just trying to focus for the moment on some of the early initiating pathologies in these diseases and trying to stop them, maybe it would be an advantage actually to be working on a single cell. And I said this at a, at a meeting not too long ago and got the following response. Well, last time I looked, yeast don't have neurotransmitters. <laughs> and uh, actually, I, I realized that I should put another slide in here because, yes, they don't have neurotransmitters, but they have the same system. For example, yeast need to find mating partners. 
So no, they don't some secrete dopamine and receive dopamine, but they secrete mating pheromones and they have receptors for mating pheromones that are very highly conserved G-coupled receptors, for example. And so the basic system, the guts of the biology of a yeast cell is, again, remarkably similar. The actual obvious downstream of, of effects of those mating factors is different than they are for neurotransmitters. But I just wanted to mention a few of the signal transducers that are conserved across yeast cells. Uh, G-coupled ligand receptors, MAP kinase, kinase, kinase cascades, all kinds of them, uh, calcium, calmodulin, calcineurin cascades, uh, crosstalk between the actin, uh, between these systems and the actin and tubulin cytoskeleton, phosphonacetyl kinases, cyclic AMP, phosphodiesterases, all these processes which are, are so important um, in, responding to the, in, in responding to and setting up the pathology in neurons, the, some of the fundamental guts of, are there in yeast cells. So can we find anything? Whoops. I'm going to go back briefly. Also, it's worth pointing out that if you look at some of the largest blockbuster drugs we have, in fact, take for example the statins, the single one most commonly prescribed drug in the developmental world, the single largest uh, money maker for pharmaceutical companies, the statins work perfectly fine in a yeast cell. So when we want to inhibit HMG-CoA reductase in our yeast cells, uh, we use Lipitor, or we use uh, Simpastatin. It works perfectly fine. It's a very, very highly conserved protein target. And in fact, the statins were actually first discovered in fungi. And these are just a few of the other drugs that are found in yeast. So anyway, what we did was to take those proteins that you see misfolding in different human diseases, and we put them into yeast cells under a regulatable promoter so we could do all the genetic manipulations and stuff in, in, in cells where they were not induced, and then simply switch the media and induce them. And what we did was we set up a, a series of strains with uh, different levels of protein expression and different levels of toxicity for alpha-synuclein, we did the same thing for A-beta, TDP43, Huntington, FUS, and now we've got a few more. Uh, I'm just showing you the highest toxicity strain for each of those um, here, here, and here. Just to show you that we've got strains that are pretty well matched in terms of their toxicity. And of course, it could have been that this was just creating some nonspecific protein aggregation toxicity. It was not going to be of, of interest uh, particularly to anybody suffering from these diseases. But that's not the case. In fact, what we find when we start looking into these cells is that the individual proteins misfold in the yeast cells and they cause toxicity in the yeast cells. But they misfold in particular places and cause very particular types of pathology that are directly relevant to human cells. And so here's an example of a blot against nitrotyrosine. And this is absolutely specific to our alpha-synuclein model, and that in a few slides I will show you is very, very intimately related to all of the diseases that are in human diseases, that are neurological diseases that involve alpha-synuclein pathology. And basically, again and again and again, when we look at the pathologies that are occurring in these cells in response to these different proteins misfolding, very, very individual pathologies. and. We can then use high throughput screening to identify genes that will correct these pathologies and identify chemical compounds that will correct these pathologies. And lo and behold, they not only work in neuronal model systems like nematodes and rat neurons, but they also work to correct the pathologies in a human IPS cells derived from patients with these diseases. At least we've done that so far with patients from, that have Parkinson's disease, and we're deriving a bunch more now. So we started with alpha-synuclein because it's such a simple little protein. It's a lipid-binding protein, and not much was known about its biology except for the fact that it binds membranes, and it binds them in a peripheral way. And also that when it's not bound to membranes, it's prone to being natively unfolded. It's not a structured protein. It's only 14 kilodaltons. It's very, very tiny. It doesn't have all kinds of complex domains. And when it's not found associated with membranes, 
comes on and off into this unfolded state, and that gives it an opportunity to form all kinds of oligomeric species and fibrils, which are toxic. So it turns out that this misfolding, as I mentioned, occurs in multiple human diseases, multiple different cell types. So we figured this protein might misbehave in a yeast cell too, and that might allow us to take advantage of these robust screening platforms. So here we are turning alpha-synuclein on and off with a galactose-inducible promoter. We are um, hooking that protein up to GFP, and I'll just tell you that the GFP doesn't make any difference, of course, we've just tested for that. Um, but it allows us to see where the protein is in the cell, and when we express one or two copies of this protein, it goes to the plasma membrane. And that's great because in neurons we know that it's associated with secretory vesicles and in fact it's the synaptic vesicles at the ends of synapses. And so if it was riding through the secretory pathway in the same way in yeast, we'd expect it to get to the plasma membrane. When we add just one extra copy or two extra copies, things change very dramatically. These cells grow normally, those cells grow very slowly, and these cells just plain outright die. Now, the reason why that was really exciting to us in, these, in the beginning days of this was that that replicates something we know about extreme dosage toxicity in man. This is, Parkinson's disease is one of the very few diseases in man where a single extra copy of the wild type gene is sufficient to cause early onset neurological disease and in fact, two extra copies causes a more virulent form of disease. And there are very few proteins in yeast that show this kind of dosage toxicity to either. So in this strain with this intermediate toxicity, that's where we do our genetic screens because we can look for genes that make cells better or worse in the same screen. It's just very efficient. And it's in that higher toxicity strain that we've screened for chemical compounds that could correct pathology because in that strain, all sorts of things are going wrong. And we figured that if there's just a storm of pathology that affects all kinds of systems, and we figured if we could stop that, then we might have a chemical compound, for example, that would hit a deeply rooted node in this, in this pathology. Um, and uh, so in doing these screens, you go through a lot of uh, stuff that's not very interesting, a lot of sand, you wind up with just a few nuggets. Of the 6,000 genes that we tested, and we tested them robustly and very carefully in many configurations, um, only about 1% affected alpha-synuclein toxicity, but what was really amazing is that several of those are now known to be involved in Parkinson's disease in human beings, and we have a way of connecting them and starting to understand their biology. So the largest single class of genes we got uh, that were involved. We got many, many different types of genes. The largest single class of genes we got were genes that were involved in vesicle trafficking. And so we said, well, things that made vesicle trafficking work better made the cells better. So we said, well, maybe alpha-synuclein is slowing down vesicle trafficking. So these are simple electron micrographs, and you can see these massive blocked vesicles, the amounts of which correlate with just how toxic the expression of alpha-synuclein is. And it turns out that it's, this is where the alpha-synuclein is located. So the alpha-synuclein is associated with these phospholipids on these secretory vesicles, and it is physically impeding their movement from donor membranes to target membranes. This has now been corroborated by a number of other laboratories and a number of other neuronal systems. And uh, we've been develop using this and other assays to develop much simpler assays. Electron microscopy is, is not a fast, high-throughput assay, but something like this, an assay which is just a little Western blot that allows you to see that when, because there's a change in banding patterns on a gel, that proteins are not, particular proteins that you can follow that are not, are not trafficking through the secretory pathway because they're not being processed properly. And that's the assay I'm gonna show you for neuronal cells in a little bit. So we took, started with taking six completely different uh, hits from our screen that were affecting very different biological pathways, and one might not have thought would be connected in any logical way. We tested those in a nematode model 
and we tested them in a rat embryonic model with the help of the Caldwell lab and the help of Chris Rocher's lab. We're now doing a lot of this ourselves in my lab, uh, ourselves in my lab. Um, anyway, all six of the hits we tried worked in the neurons using the homologs uh, that corresponded to these conserved genes that, that are present, uh, conserved across uh, evolution from yeast to these organisms. Another way in which we've confirmed that things that we're finding are meaningful is that one of our, in fact now several of the genes that we've hit in our yeast screen uh, are actually human disease genes that cause early onset Parkinson's. This is the first hit we had which um, was a gene that was reported after, uh, several months after our screen to when, be mutated in people who have early onset Parkinson's disease, but it wasn't known in any way to be related to alpha-synuclein. But we found it as a suppressor of alpha-synuclein toxicity. It was a P-type ATPase located at the lysosome of human cells, and so it was in fact located in the same, we went back and looked in our yeast cells, we go back and forth this way, and in fact, it was found at the lysosomal compartment equivalent of the yeast cell. And then we introduced the human mutations and asked, well, what do they do to affect the biology of the yeast cells? And it turns out that the wild-type protein protects yeast cells from manganese, and the mutated forms of this protein that are present in the human patients uh, do not have that capacity. That's of interest because manganese um, exposure has been correlated with uh, Parkinson's disease, a Parkinsonian-like disease at least, uh, in many, many different ways. So using yeast, we've linked alpha-synuclein to vesicle trafficking defects, mitochondrial dysfunction, manganese homeostasis defects, iron and calcium homeostasis, um, and previously unconnected human mutations. What about other human mutations? Well, we've been able to take the 60 hits from our screen connect them together, taking advantage of vast amounts of genetic data. There have been tens of thousands of genome-wide screens performed in yeast, not by my lab, I hasten to say, but by other laboratories, and a lot of mass spec data, et cetera. These are the connections between those 60 hits from our screen, genetic and physical connections. We've only, I'm only showing you uh, the very, very most robust of those connections. And in yellow are the genes that actually feature in human neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's particular and forms of ataxias and dystonias, et cetera, that have Parkinsonian features. So uh, what about human stem cells? I don't have to tell you guys about the promise of human stem cells. Um, so we've... Uh, uh, identified, we've uh, taken advantage of the wonderful work that other people have done in, in making stem cells from human patients. And uh, one of my, the neurologists in my lab uh, identified a patient with uh, s several patients that have early onset Parkinson's disease as well. Um, we've differentiated them into, uh, made iPS cells, differentiated them into patient neurons. And then um, with the extraordinary technical wizardry of the Yanish lab, which uh, it, we are fortunate enough to be in the same building with, um, they did surgical correction of some of these mutations, uh, one in particular, the A53T mutation, back uh, to, a, to the, a, a, from A53T, synuclein mutation, back to A. So then these dish neurons are sitting in a dish, and we don't see any difference between them. And after 12 weeks of differentiation, we still don't see any difference to them, between them. And this presents us with a really central problem in this uh, field, is how do you find phenotypes when the disease does not strike human beings until, even with these early onset mutations, does not strike them until they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s. So basically what we did was to go back to yeast cells and remember what the phenotypes were that we saw in yeast and ask whether we could find them in these uh, neurons before there was any overt pathology. So well before we can see the cells dying, yes indeed we can see those processes disturbed and they're corrected by the uh, surgical correction that was done in the Yanish laboratory. <laughs>
So here's an example of those gels I was telling you about where you can follow uh, proteins trafficking through the secretory pathway. Changes in the banding patterns just simply indicate there's problems in that, in that trafficking and they're corrected by the mutation. And these are a couple of different kindreds. Um, for the Iowa kindred, which has the triplication, we could not use surgical correction, at least not yet. We've, we've just relied upon having control um, uh, patient uh, iPS cells. So um, let me just show you another thing, that, that the reason why we got to this uh, nitration defect in our yeast cells was because one of the genes we picked up in the screen protects yeast cells from NO. And so uh, then we went to look in neurons because there had already been a great deal of interest in uh, nitration in both in Parkinson's disease, multiple systems atrophy, and nerve brain iron accumulation three different diseases all associated with alpha-synuclein pathology, protein nitration uh, found, it, found by pathologists studying these diseases. In yeast cells, we not only found that there was a storm of NO and a storm of reactive nitrogen species, we found that that was a highly localized storm. And so we went to our human IPS neurons and found, too, that that was a highly localized storm of NO damage and corrected by the correction mutation. So now, what about a chemical library screen? Can we find completely new chemical entities, completely new types of, types of chemical matter that are not with, with unknown mechanisms of action that might correct these pathologies and use yeast genetics to find the targets? Because one of the reasons the pharmaceutical industry has been avoiding uh, phenotypic screens with agents with unknown mechanisms of action is because it's damned hard to find the mechanism of action. So I'm going to cut through this fairly quickly and just tell you that we screened 5,000 compounds. We simply asked for them to restore growth. We've only dissected a few so far, but they correct the vesicle trafficking defect, they correct mitochondrial defects, they correct the nitrosylation defects, and they work the ones that we've looked at work in the nematode, rat, and human neurons. And um, this is just an example of some of the phenotypes being corrected in yeast by the compounds, the nitration defect being corrected, the trafficking defect being corrected in the human IPS, uh, and the neurons derived from human IPS cells, the nitrosative defect being corrected in those uh, same neurons. And we found the target by doing four different kinds of genome-wide genetic screens, which just aren't possible in any other organism before, uh, or any other organism yet, rather. And so the target is a very interesting one. It's a ubiquitin ligase, very highly conserved in all of its component parts from yeast to man. It's a protein that has been particularly difficult to study biochemically, undergoes many different conformational changes, and uh, associates with lots of different adapters and, and substrates. So um, there are s almost 700 ubiquitin ligases in man. They affect all kinds of protein homeostasis pathways, and they've been virtually untouched by the pharmaceutical industry because they are so darn hard to study in an isolated in vitro context. We think their biology emerges really only in the context of a living cell. So here's an example of uh, the secretory and, and vesicle trafficking uh, uh, pathway in yeast. And these are the steps where alpha-synuclein acts. These are the steps where that ubiquitin ligase acts. It pushes forward vesicle trafficking and basically unblocks this entire block that's caused by alpha-synuclein. And so basically the, I'm finishing by telling you that we have extraordinarily parallel effects of alpha-synuclein in yeast cells and in neurons, um, profound changes in vesicle trafficking that play out in uh, pheromones and neurotransmitter uh, trafficking, uh, recycling, um, focal bursts of nitric oxide and protein nitration, mitochondrial dysfunction, which I didn't have to tell you about, bursts of reactive oxygen species, and perturbations in metal ion homeostasis. So there are many other diseases out there they have to be tackled. We need novel approaches. 
Our approach is only one, but we're now working on uh, many of these other diseases as well. And again, we will be able to do nothing without being able to marry this with the kinds of extraordinary biology that you guys are doing with human iPS cells and other neuronal models. So um, I welcome any thoughts from you about diseases we might model. I showed you some of the ones that we are already modeling. And I just want to finish this being such an international meeting by saying thanks to you in many of your languages. And also, these particular languages are the languages of the people in my laboratory uh, that were involved in this research. Uh, and um, I, I want to also just show their faces. These are the guys who have been working on the stress responses and cancer biology. Just a remarkable, remarkable group of, of people in my laboratory. I am so grateful to them. These are the folks that started the alpha synuclein work and have now left my lab. These are the folks who are still in my lab and did all the, the recent stuff I told you about. And a chemist, Nate Jewey, from Steve Buckwald's lab. These are the amazing collaborators who participated in that story I've just told you about. Um, again, wouldn't be able to do any of this stuff without being able to work with these amazing people. And this is the Whitehead Institute, which has also been really a, a, a fantastic place to work. Um, I want to thank it. I've been there for about 12 years now, and I just love it. And by the way, for any of you who have very talented students who are looking for postdocs, I'm going to be going into the stem cell field for the first <laughs> in a big way in the future. And it's a, it's a great place to be. So uh, thanks again. We have a little time for some questions, please. Yes. Okay, very impressive. Uh, in the East Park 9 a mutant, uh, so do they show a defect in the autophagy? Um, we haven't tested that. That's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. We see, do see some defects in autophagy in our system. Mm -hmm. And some of the genes that we got out of our screen, those 60 genes I mentioned to you that we got out of our screen, two of them are involved in autophagy. They don't seem to be, uh, and they influence, obviously, we wouldn't have gotten them out of our genetic screen unless they do influence the pathology of alpha-synuclein. They don't influence it as strongly as some of the other uh, pathways that we see. But I think in, in many of these diseases, autophagy is going to turn out to be at one of the, the central uh, processes perturbed. It's just not, not the only one. Yeah, because this enzyme is required acidification of the lysosome, so I'm yep. just wondering if you know, autophagy is impaired. Yeah, oh, thank you for telling me that. I didn't yeah. know that. Mm -hmm. just, just one of some stupid questions. So, uh, in the case of the Parkinson's disease, uh, the aggregation of the alpha synuclein and its prion like propagation to cell mm -hmm. to cell is a very important role. Mm -hmm. Can you recapture those processes in the EC system? Uh, we, yeah, in, it's very interesting because we do a lot of work on prions. Uh, the prion phenomenon actually exists in yeast cells mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and actually a significant fraction of my lab is studying prion biology. But in our particular model, it's not going, the cells are dying before they get to the point of forming an amyloid-like self-propagating uh, complex. We've thought about studying that in our yeast cells, but there are other aspects of prion biology in yeast that we're a little bit more interested in, and there's so many people doing such able work on that in the neuronal systems as it is. So we're really more concentrated in, in our yeast models on um, the pre-amyloid state and, and on the early pathology that's, getting, that's starting to initiate some of those, those triggers rather than the, the propagating from cell to cell. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have one question too. Um, in the yeast screens, uh, are you, how long can you wait for the pathology to emerge in the yeast before you can intervene with the reagents? Can you do it before? So we, we've done, that's a great question, because it really would be very interesting to know whether you, 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 yeah. you can intervene post facto yeah. or, or whether you can prevent disease. Exactly. But both are <laughs> equally important. Yeah. But really, what, we're, we're still at the beginning stages here, and we are doing our genetic screens and our chemical screens uh, at this, we, we, we look for gene, we turn on other genes and we add chemicals at the same time that we turn on the proteins. Uh, 
and um, we've got so much on our hands to study and it's, that we just haven't had a chance to do this sequential aspect, but I think it's very, very important. What I can tell you is that um, we have some neuronal models in which, and again, it's early days, in which we, we apply our chemical compounds and our genes after some of the pathology has already started, and they, they work to ameliorate it. Um, so I think, I think that there is a prospect both of doing something preventative as well as uh, yeah, uh, the correcting assay, pathology. The assay is very yeah. permissive for this. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, I think we're coming to the end of our meeting. Thank you one last yeah. time. To